Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenters are Dr. Arun Srivatsa and Dr. Mary Maish. Dr. Srivatsa completed his undergraduate training at St. Joseph's College in Bangalore, India. He graduated from Bangalore Medical College. He completed his internal medicine residency as well as his gastroenterology fellowship at the University of Rochester Medical Center in Rochester, New York. Dr. Srivatsa is board certified in internal medicine and board eligible in gastroenterology. Dr. Mary Maish is a thoracic surgeon with the Washington Township Medical Foundation. Dr. Maish received her medical degree from Rush Medical College in Chicago. She completed her surgical internship at Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Hospital in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. She did her surgical residency at Michigan State University in East Lansing, Michigan, and at the University of Pennsylvania St. Luke's Hospital in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And she did her cardiothoracic research fellowship at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. Dr. Maish received a master's in public health at Harvard University in Boston, Massachusetts. She did her thoracic surgery residency at Baylor College of Medicine in Maryland and at the Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. She completed her Forget Division Clinical Fellowship at the University of Southern California. Dr. Maish is board certified by the American Board of Surgery and the American Board of Thoracic Surgery. I'm a gastroenterologist at Washington Township uh, Medical Foundation, and we have Dr. Maish, who's a surgeon with the foundation. Um, so both of us focus and uh, treat acid reflux and disorders of the foregut um, differently and sometimes uh, complementarily and uh, based on the severity and uh, the type of illness uh, usually we can help you out in one way or the other. <clears throat> so uh, with that I'm going to start off um, with this talk. Uh, we're going to focus on heartburn, the symptoms that one might have when, when you have acid reflux and um, the problems and complications that can happen when that goes untreated. So here we have uh, two different types of uh, people who have heartburn. Gentleman on the left is young, he's maybe 30 years old, um, doesn't have heartburn very frequently, maybe once a month, maybe twice a month, um, maybe when he watches the Super Bowl or a game uh, after pizza or soda or maybe a little alcohol and usually is pretty well controlled when you take something over the counter like an antacid. How many here might have had symptoms like this? All right. So quite a few um, hands went up and on average about 50 percent of US adults have had heartburn like this at least once or twice during their lifetime. Gentleman on the right is a little older maybe maybe in his 50s or 60s, um, he gets heartburn every day. Um, there's some relief with over-the-counter products like Tums, Maalox, but he's had symptoms for over 10 years. Um, and now his symptoms are getting more and more frequent. So I was gonna say that the person on the left probably has symptoms that are okay and the person on the right has symptoms that certainly need more evaluation. All right. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about the difference between heartburn and GERD. I know you've heard both, talk, both terms used before. Heartburn mainly is a symptom. 
It's like the fire alarm or a smoke detector going off. It tells you that there's a problem. It's telling your body that there's, there's something going on. It's an alarm symptom. And where there's smoke, there's usually fire. So GERD is the actual fire. That heartburn is telling your body that there's something going on. And that problem is GERD. So GERD is gastroesophageal reflux. It just tells you that there's acid that's in the stomach normally that's making its way up into the food pipe and causing inflammation or other disease processes, complications, and that's why your body is sensing the symptom of heartburn. The, the top of the slide here, um, it tells you how we're gonna progress this talk. Um, so you have heartburn and GERD and then you have various complications that can occur. And right now we're focusing on the yellow bar which is acid reflux disease or GERD. So some of the symptoms of acid reflux disease one is heartburn, which is a sensation that there's this burning sensation in your, in your chest right behind your heart. Usually occurs about a half hour after you eat something really spicy or with lots of tomatoes or acidic food, like you know, something that's vinegar-based. Or sometimes after alcohol or smoking. Sometimes even after exercise, after you eat a heavy meal and hit the gym, trying to work it off. Some people have trouble sleeping. You know, they eat a big meal, they go lie down, and everything starts coming back up. <coughs> some people just have a lot of gas and bloating. And some people just cannot handle certain foods. You know, there, there are food limitations that they have to abide by. You know, they're, they're not going to eat certain spices. <coughs> they're not going to eat in certain tomato sauces. No certain types of salad dressings for them. Some people can just have cough. <coughs> You know, they, they eat a big meal and then they're coughing. All of a sudden they have asthma attacks. Some, t some people have pneumonias because of acid coming back up. So the prevalence of GERD or acid reflux on a monthly basis is almost one in every two Americans. So that's about 30 million folks that have acid reflux on a monthly basis. Now there's a condition known as Barrett's esophagus, which occurs in a significantly smaller proportion of those people, but that's the focus of this talk, or one of the main focuses, um, because that's a complication of acid reflux disease. So basically for the remainder of the talk, we're gonna talk about what causes acid reflux and what are the complications of acid reflux, how you can control it with medicines and other techniques, including surgery, and what happens if you don't manage this condition well? <clears throat> so here's a little schematic. Um, this here is your stomach. And here's your food pipe. And this muscle here is your diaphragm. This muscle separates your chest, including your lungs, from what's in your belly. And normally what, what happens is this muscle acts like a tight little valve um, in addition to another valve that the food pipe itself has right there to prevent acid from going back up into your food pipe. Now as when, when a baby is born, um, you know, babies spit up, they have a lot of reflux, milk comes back up. And as, as children grow older, the diaphragm and this valve and the food pipe really become strong and quite adept at preventing acid reflux. And then as one starts aging, um, college years, alcohol, parties, pizzas, Super Bowls, all these muscles start losing their, their strength and their um, eff efficacy in preventing acid reflux. So by the time one is 50, or even in their 40s, heartburn becomes quite common. Meaning at least, you know, once a month, twice a month, once a year, everyone's going to have some heartburn. And this, the second diagram here shows you what happens. As, as people grow a little older, there's a little more fat in the belly. Everything get, kind of gets straightened out. The diaphragm no longer is in that great tone. And acid can start going back up because the valve is no longer working as well. 
So moving forward, pretty much the same um, topic we just uh, addressed. Certain factors worsen acid reflux, like carrying a lot of weight around your midsection, diet indiscretions, um, apart from age, smoking, and certain medications too. For example, most over-the-counter pain pills like ibuprofen, Advil, Aleve can worsen heartburn. Certain steroids can worsen heartburn. Certain osteoporosis medications can cause inflammation of your food pipe. So what can you do for heartburn? I mean, I've, I've made it seem like it's the worst thing on earth to have, but it really isn't. I mean, most, most of the times, heartburn can be well controlled with minor lifestyle changes. You know, pizza with uh, peppers on it bothers you. You don't eat it and you don't have heartburn anymore. You drink a six pack of beer and you're, you know, you're beside yourself in agony. Well, you're not gonna do it anytime soon again. Um, but certain pills, um, if, if you're taking pills that you're worried about, you should address that with your physician and see if those pills, like prescription medicines for osteoporosis, may be causing your symptoms. Pain medicines, if you have arthritis, you know, you're on Advil or Aleve or extra strength ibuprofen that's prescription, you might want to talk to your physician and see if that's worsening your heartburn. We're going to talk about surgical options when Dr. Mesh um, begins her talk. Um, as always, you know, there's, there's different treatment strategies for different people, but the purpose of this talk is to tell you that there's always something that can be done for heartburn based on the individual patient's circumstances. So it's, it's not something that's without a cure. So how many people can actually stay away from foods if their heartburn is occurring every day? So if, if this is a periodic phenomenon, it's occurring frequently, you're limiting your food all the time, then you know, you're, not, you're not getting much out of your lifestyle. Um, you, know, you could eat slowly, you could lose a little weight if you're you know, a little heavier around the mid midsection, as I said. You should certainly stop smoking to see if it helps. But if you're doing all the above, and your heartburn, you know, like in the second gentleman that I showed you, you know, he's slightly older, he's having frequent recurrent attacks, then clearly you need something else other than lifestyle changes. So we come to the medicine section. So there are a bunch of medicines that, you know, they're over-the-counter antacids. Um, they're over-the-counter and prescription H2 blockers. And I'm sure that most of you who have had heartburn have heard of Maalox, Tums, Zantac, Pepsid, and Tagamet. So these, these medicines have been around for a while. Most of them are safe if used as prescribed. Um, and then, of course, there are the newer prescription medicines which also have been around. They're, they're newer, but they've been around for several years as well. And I'm sure you've heard of Prilosec, Prevacid, Nexium, Dexalant. Uh, these are all prescription, but some of them have now become over the counter as well. The antacids can be taken as needed. The H2 blockers can be combined with food or without food. And the PPIs, the newest ones, ideally work on an empty stomach once a day, early in the morning. So let's move on to certain complications of uncontrolled heartburn. So this, uh, the picture on the left shows an uh, endoscope, which is a thin tube with a camera, taking a look inside the food pipe. And this, this area here, the junction of the food pipe and stomach, is usually what we focus on when we're looking for heartburn complications. So when we look through an endoscope, this is the picture that we see. This, this here is the entrance into the stomach. And the pale pink mucosa, or the pale pink lining that you see around here towards the edges, that's healthy tissue. It's nice and healthy. And these kind of salmon-colored patches, islands of inflammation, are what could be Barrett's esophagus. It was named after the person who first described it. And it's tissue that has changed because of prolonged exposure to acid, um, which shouldn't be there. There really shouldn't be any acid in your food pipe. 
because the food pipe is not a digestive organ. It's just a pipe that takes food from your mouth to your stomach where digestion is supposed to occur. So the lining of the food pipe is sensitive to acid. Prolonged exposure can lead to inflammation and the inflammation can then lead to Barrett's esophagus. So just another view of different slides. Um, this first circle here shows a normal um, junction between the food pipe and stomach. The second one here shows esophagitis, which is just another term for severe inflammation. You can see that um, there's a lot of pus-like secretions with mucus. There are red streaks. And this is a food pipe that's being severely inflamed from repeated exposure to acid. Now when, when we see this and we treat this with medicines, sometimes when the tissue heals, that's when you see Barrett's esophagus. And this is Barrett's that has formed in an area where there was inflammation before. So Barrett's esophagus essentially is, the lining of the food pipe changes and becomes more like small intestine lining. Now small intestine is exposed to stomach acid and is able to neutralize stomach acid because it has more mucus and it can secrete um, substances that protect it. So this, this seems to be an effort by the food pipe to modify its lining and become more like small intestine lining. The problem with that is it's not natural. It's not how the food pipe is designed to behave. And when the cells start behaving in, in a way that they're not supposed to, that's known as metaplasia. So metaplasia is the, the cells of the food pipe begin to look like the cells of the small intestine. That's called metaplasia, and that's what Barrett's esophagus is. And when you have cells that are behaving differently, they are acting differently, and they're rapidly dividing in an effort to curb inflammation because cells are dying faster from the inflammation. So you have increased rates of cell division, you have cells behaving differently. There's more chances of errors that occur when the cells divide and multiply, and soon you can have precancerous cells appear. It's sort of like sunlight exposure leads to skin cancer because of repeated episodes of inflammation and increased cell turnover. Um, the same thing with the food pipe. So the, the slide at the bottom on the left shows Barrett's that has progressed. It's extending throughout the field of view and there are small nodules of dysplasia. These are precancerous lesions in the food pipe. And that's how cancer starts. So this, this here, this little bump that everyone can see, hopefully, is a precancerous nodule that eventually can turn into something like this, which is full-blown esophageal cancer. Now, esophageal cancer has been rising in incidence, and this is just one slide that um, shows you how, compared to the other rates of cancer, like for example, breast, prostate, lung, and colon, where the, you know, the rates have risen because of improved diagnosis and improved screening methods, um, esophageal cancer seems to have really taken off. And we're not sure why. It, it could be that you know, people are just getting um, maybe more obese, maybe eating and drinking um, things that corrode the esophagus, more alcohol, more smoking, or living longer, maybe you know, as life expectancy improves, there's more time for acid to cause more damage. But as I said, I don't want this talk to be all somber and you know, full of bad news. The point is there is treatment available for all these conditions. So Barrett's esophagus needs to be looked at like a precancerous condition. And just like you have mammograms for the breast and you have colonoscopies for colon polyps, and you have your dermatology visits and you know you can get your skin lesions zapped and removed. The same way if you have frequent heartburn, you need to get an endoscopy, see if you do have any inflammation, if you do have any Barrett's, 
And if you do, there's treatment available to remove or ablate the Barrett's esophagus. So the, the several approaches to treating Barrett's esophagus. One approach is surveillance, meaning you, you just monitor it closely. You can bring the patient back in six months to a year, see if it went away because of improved lifestyle changes, better treatment, someone who's never been on medicines, now is on medicines, see if that takes it away. Um, the second method is EMR, which is endoscopic mucosal resection, which is just a fancy term for saying we use the endoscope to neatly resect the whole area of abnormality. So we can do that here at Washington Hospital. It's a little more involved than your regular endoscopy. Um, is usually done with anesthesia as opposed to just moderate sedation and is good for small areas of Barrett's esophagus. The third method, um, which we'll talk about in a little more detail, is ablation using radio frequency. So these are special um, uh, energy waves that can be administered to the area of abnormality and they affect about a millimeter to two in terms of depth and they get rid of all the abnormal tissue. And when the tissue grows back, it's usually always normal esophageal lining. So that's called radiofrequency ablation. And here you see almost 98% eradication rates for Barrett's, which is intestinal metaplasia. And in someone even with nodules or with low-grade dysplasia, or even high-grade dysplasia, which is a very precancerous condition, you see excellent eradication rates. So almost nine out of 10 patients are cured with this um, non-surgical method. So let's talk a little bit more about what we do during ablation. So we do a standard endoscopy and we identify the junction of the food pipe and stomach, which is right there. And down below here is normal stomach tissue, which is usually resistant to acid. And up here is the food pipe and all the way up here is the junction between the normal pale epithelium or the pale lining and the inflamed or uh, abnormal Barrett's <coughs> mucosa. So we identify the area that needs to be ablated or addressed with this energy called radiofrequency ablation. The catheter that we use is then introduced and it has this structure here that imparts energy to the area that needs to be ablated. We then inflate the catheter and it delivers energy to the lining of the food pipe. It, it takes a few, few milliseconds to do this. We deflate the catheter and then reinflate it lower down to ablate the rest of the abnormal area. So once we do that, the abnormal area is completely, um, you know, it, it's completely affected by the energy and over a week or so it, it sloughs off naturally and when it's replaced over the next few weeks, it usually is replaced by normal esophageal lining. If you have small uh, spots that are still uh, present in a repeat endoscopy down the road, you know, two, two months later or three months later, if you have a small spot that needs to be touched up, you can use a smaller probe um, with smaller energy being delivered to ablate the rest of the tissue. So here's an example of a patient who had Barrett's as seen here. You have these little areas and islands of abnormal tissue and about three to four months later, after delivery of radiofrequency ablation or RFA, everything has been nicely removed and everything is healed well. <coughs> All right, I'll stop here and Dr. Mesh will, will resume. So moving on, um, I'm going to talk a lot about the non-medical treatments for GERD, of which now there are quite a few. So the first thing is, why do we want to treat GERD? Well, I mean, 
there's a variety of different reasons, both medical and non-medical conditions that can result from it. But most people kind of come to the, to the doctor because they're uncomfortable and GERD is interfering with their lifestyle. It can be very inconvenient to have such a restrictive diet and manage in social and work sit settings. Um, and then, of course, there are medical conditions like Barrett's esophagus, which in and of itself um, can be concerning because the rate of progression to cancer is becoming much more known. Um, but there are other things, too. Um, you may have a hiatal hernia, which is something that I'll describe to let you know what that is. And if that's the case, the only way to fix that is going to be through some kind of surgical intervention. And then things like scarring of the esophagus, ear problems, dental decay, lung issues, recurrent pneumonias. And then lastly, the esophagus doesn't function properly when it has uh, acid constantly sloshing up inside of it. So over time, you can develop a disorder of the function of your esophagus where it doesn't squeeze very well and it'll have difficulty then propelling food and other stuff through. So there are a lot of things. So as we can see, uncomfortable, that's the number one reason why people come to see us is because they feel very uncomfortable. But they also want to be able to continue to eat some of the bad foods that they otherwise would have to nix off their list. Um, and people are concerned about getting cancer. Um, I mean, uh, the risks is about 44 times greater if you have GERD um, over a 20-year period of time, which is usually the time span that we see patients coming to see us. And if you have Barrett's esophagus, you have a 2% risk per year. So you may not even know you have Barrett's. And every year you have a 2% risk of progressing through that dysplasia progress that Dr. Srivatsa talked to you about all the way to cancer. So it's something that is progressing rapidly in this country, and we don't know why. Although we do know, uh, like Dr. Shravatsa commented, that uh, certainly the large overweight population that we have seems to be a factor. But also um, there could be some other factors such as uh, covering up the symptoms with over-the-counter medicines and not recognizing that that doesn't stop the problem. That just stops the symptoms. So let's start a little bit about anatomy. So we know here that the normal uh, anatomy is the esophagus that comes through the chest underneath this big muscle called the diaphragm and then comes under the diaphragm through one small hole and joins the stomach. That's normal. But when you have a hiatal hernia, it's where the stomach pushes itself up through that opening, sometimes making that opening quite much, much bigger and then part of the stomach is resting in the chest cavity, which is abnormal. That's a hiatal hernia. Hiatal hernias can come and go. Sometimes when you're standing up, your, your esophagus may look like this. And when you lie down at night, the stomach pushes up like this. So a lot of times people will come in to see me and say, yeah, well, most of the time I have symptoms at night. Well, I bet you have a hiatal hernia. Because if your symptoms are occurring at night, it's likely that your stomach is pushing up underneath the diaphragm and causing those problems. Strictures are things that occur in the esophagus from ongoing inflammation. So we know, for instance, if you fall down and you skin your knee as a child, when the scar forms, it causes the skin to sort of tighten up. And this is the same in the esophagus. You start out, just like Dr. Shravasa said, with just inflammation or these red streaks. But as the esophagus tries to heal itself, it becomes very stiff and forms a heavy scar. And that can lead to much more severe problems, such as difficulty swallowing, not being able to gain weight, which maybe in some cases is not a bad thing. But we don't want weight to be uh, something we, we uncontrolled, right? We only want to do weight loss when we can control it. People can have very significant dental decay and ear problems, recurrent ear infections. Uh, also, we can see problems in the lung because the windpipe which is right here, it's the blue thing right here, is very close, as you can see, to the red food pipe. And at nighttime, when you lie down, the acid from your stomach can come all the way up your esophagus and whoop, slip right into your windpipe. Some people complain of waking up in the middle of the night coughing and gasping or this choking feeling. And this is because the acid, even if you don't know about it while you're sleeping, is trickling into your airway and causing these problems. 
And sometimes the first presenting symptoms of bad reflux disease is that you've had to be treated for pneumonia several times and you've never had pneumonia before in your life. And that can be the first symptom. Another symptom can be that your voice all of a sudden got hoarse and you don't know why. It can because, be because acid has been coming back up into the back of your esophagus, into your throat. So over time, your esophagus, just like the diaphragm muscle and the bottom part of your esophagus, like Dr. Shravatsa was talking about, can get weak because of just the loss of tone of your muscles as we age. And this can also happen to the esophageal muscle. So it's common that we hear complaints in more elderly population that the food is starting to get stuck and things don't go down as well and pills get stuck and it's harder to eat and have to eat slower and drink more water. This is because of the loss of the squeeze or the function of the esophagus. But reflux disease can make this worse. So the acid can actually cause deterioration of the function of the muscle even more. And that's a problem that we've identified and it's called IEM or ineffective esophageal motility and it is caused by reflux disease. And we don't want that to happen because again, that's going to cause difficulty swallowing which could lead to weight loss and a variety of other problems. So how do we know who has what? How do we know if you have a hiatal hernia versus if you just have slowing down of the esophageal muscle with age or if your pneumonia is caused from the disease called GERD? How do we know? Well, if you come to see one of us, we're going to put you through a battery of very uncomfortable tests. And I say that up front because I don't want you to be shocked, but it is important. These are necessary tests to determine if you are the person that actually has the disease or if your heartburn is just the fire alarm, but there is no fire. Because the last thing we want to do is put you on a medicine that's unnecessary or worse yet, perform a surgery on you that's completely unnecessary, right? So you have to have all of these procedures. So I'm going to walk through these with you just a little bit. The endoscopy is something you're probably fairly familiar with. It's just like a colonoscopy, only we put the tube in your mouth instead of in your rear end. But you're done under light sedation, so you kind of don't really remember anything. You're given happy juice. And we take a look on the inside to see what's going on. We can look at whether or not you have esophagitis or inflammation there. We can also see if you have Barrett's or a hiatal hernia. And we can also see if you have other problems that don't relate to reflux disease at all that could be causing some of your symptoms. Now there are other ways to do this fancy test that are a lot more comfortable and I'm sure you've seen advertisements for this where you can swallow this little pill and it'll go down your esophagus into your stomach and eventually come out your rear end. Well, it's a very attractive option, however, we don't really get a very good look and we don't get to take any biopsies. So when you come to see us and we don't give you this option, don't despair. It's because we don't feel it's a good option for you. We have another great test that you might be interested in, in understanding before you actually have to do it. We take a little probe and we shove it up your nose and it goes into your esophagus and down into your stomach. And after that uncomfortable feeling, we then give you a delicious cocktail of things to drink. And while you're drinking that, we get to measure the squeeze to see how well your esophagus squeezes and to see whether that valve that Dr. Shravatsa was referring to before is functioning properly or if it's maybe aged a little bit or maybe you beat it up a little bit too badly in college with all that beer and other kinds of substances. So this is done two different tests two different probes. One you do and it takes about a half an hour right in the office. The other one you get to wear and go home with it. And we show it off to all your friends and colleagues to say I'm having a pH test. And that test allows us to determine what is actually coming into your esophagus. Is it acid? Is it bile? Is it something else? And through that test, we can determine if you have acid reflux or bile reflux or some other form of reflux disease. And it gives us this fancy picture with lots of colors and we get to evaluate it and tell you exactly what's going on. And if we're lucky, we'll have a single diagnosis that says you have reflux disease. However, I will admit that most of the time it's not that simple. The last test is 
something called a barium swallow. It's where you drink a flavored chalky substance in usually strawberry or banana flavor. And while you're drinking it, we take pictures, determine whether or not your esophagus is functioning properly, see how long your esophagus is, to see whether you have a hiatal hernia when you're standing up straight or lying down, and to see whether or not you have any reflux. So those, con those four tests, after you complete them, will give us an idea of what kind of disease you have and whether or not we have any good treatment options for you, which most of the time we have something to offer. So we can say that you can sort of parcel it off into three kinds of categories, diet modification, medicines, and surgery or interventions. And we talked already about the elimination diet, which basically is nearly impossible for anybody to follow, but I wish you all very good luck. Or we have a holistic diet, where you can eat some grass and tree bark, and that's also been known to work very well. But in all seriousness, if you took these diets uh, and followed them very well, the chance of you being able to eliminate your symptoms are probably pretty high. Um, it's amazing how many people have come to me and told me that they really went on a strong regimen of controlling their diet, not just what they eat, but how much they eat, what times of the day they're eating, how slowly they're eating, et cetera, and they are able to manage their reflux disease. So you should give it a good try before you throw in the towel and seek other options. The other thing that you might consider doing is modifying the way that you sleep. And if you're alone, it's pretty easy. If you have a partner, they may not be so great and uh, happy about this. But propping the head of, of your bed up um, is a good way to eliminate the possibility of acid rolling into your trachea or your windpipe while you're sleeping at night, especially if you really don't know what's going on. Medications work great. They take away the symptoms, and they've made it work because the medical industry spent $8 billion to get it to work well, and they are fabulous. Some of these medicines have honestly changed people's lives. But we have to understand that the medicines will take away the symptom, right? It takes away the fire alarm, but it will not take away the problem. If you have a hiatal hernia or if your valve is loose, the medicines will not help change that. It will only take away your symptoms. However, many people experience heartburn without actually having either one of those two problems. So the medicines are perfectly safe and very good to treat the majority of people that have reflux. But if you happen to be somebody who falls into the category where the diet modification doesn't work, the medicines also don't work for you, and we've been able to document that you have a problem through one of our four really great tests, then there are options for you that we can offer. Now, I'm going to be a little biased in terms of what I recommend because over the years, some of these things have been well tested and work better. Um, however, as a surgeon and an advanced endoscopist, at one time or other, I have been able to offer all four of these. So I do have firsthand experience. The first one is called the Streta probe, and this was designed about 10 years ago. The probe would be inserted into the esophagus right at the valve, the location of the valve, which you can see right here. And it's a radio frequency, similar to the other radio frequency probe that Dr. Shravatsa was talking about with regards to Barrett's esophagus. And the radio frequency is shot through the edges of the lining of the esophagus, creating inflammation and creating a scar. So you can see here that after the procedure, the walls of the esophagus at the level of the valve become thicker. And this is supposed to prevent the acid from going from the stomach up into the esophagus, which it does. Of course, there's always pros and cons. The pros are that this is done under a, a, a light sedation in the endoscopy suite. You don't have to go to the hospital. There are no incisions. It's very easy and very quick to perform. It sometimes takes more than one time, but rarely so. So it seems very attractive. The problem with it is that if you have a hiatal hernia, it's very difficult to locate exactly where to put the probe. It's not controlled, so we don't know how much heat is delivered 
to cause a certain scar on everybody. It's just a little different on everybody. Why? Because I have less fat inside of me than some of you in the room. Some of you have hiatal hernias that are going to affect the ability of the heat to uh, to go through the probe into the esophageal tissue. So some people are going to come out with a perfect result. Other people, it's going to be too tight and they're not going to be able to swallow. And yet more people are going to have it be too loose where it really doesn't do anything. The other problem with the strata is that over two year period of time, about 70% of the time it fails. So it's not a great uh, procedure anymore. It's not something that, that I recommend, but it has been done in the past and I wanted to present it so you would understand what it's all about. There's another newer procedure that's been out for about five to seven years. It's called transoral, which means through the mouth, incisionless, so no scars or incisions, fundoplication. A fundoplication is where we take part of the stomach and wrap it around the bottom part of the esophagus to make that valve strong. But this is all done with an endoscope. So again, it's done this time under a general anesthesia because we need you to be completely sedated. And we put a very large camera into your esophagus that has this fancy instrument attached to it at the bottom. And this instrument will tuck the edges of the stomach up over the top of the esophagus and put in staples all the way around, about 15 of them, which if you're unlucky, like many people, you'll end up coming to see me and I'll have to struggle to take all 15 of those staples out in the operating room. But when it works, it works very well. The pros are that generally it's maybe an overnight stay. Often it's an outpatient procedure. There's almost no discomfort, so it's easy in terms of the post-op recovery. It is all done endoscopically or with the camera through the mouth and there's no incisions. But the cons are that also it's a little difficult to know if you've made it too loose or too tight. It's not uh, well regulated. Although it is better than the strata, it's not quite as good as some of the other methods that I'm going to talk to you about in a few minutes. It's also something that cannot be done if you have a large hiatal hernia or anything more than just two centimeters. And it often comes undone because the staples don't hold the tissue very well in some situations. And who might that be? Again, that could be in somebody who has a little bit more body fat or somebody who's a little bit older where the tissues don't hold sutures very well. And it also doesn't address the hole in the diaphragm that often is the cause of an ongoing problem with reflux. So that, that is not something that we uh, recommend to all kinds of people, but certainly if you're interested in it, we can talk further about it. The next thing, which is the most common way to surgically treat your reflux disease, is to have a minimally invasive surgery performed, which is what we call a fundoplication or laparoscopic Nissen fundoplication. I'm sure you've heard lots of these words thrown out over the years. And just a small bit of history on it, years ago when reflux was just as prevalent as it is now, it was something that was not easily treated in the operating room because it required that we made these big incisions on the body and it was a very difficult operation to perform. But when laparoscopy came out in the late 80s and early 90s, we were now able to do this all through four or five small little incisions about the size of my pinky nail, which we place around the top part of the abdomen, which you can see here. With those small incisions, we put in some cameras and some extensions of our arms, very, very small little spoon type instruments that allow us to grab the top part of the stomach and wrap it around the bottom part of the esophagus. So we put our instrument behind the es esophagus here. We grab what we call the fundus or the top of the stomach. We pull it around the bottom part of the esophagus and now we create this valve. And the thing that works so beautifully about this is that when we eat, food, comes down, food and air comes down our esophagus and it causes our stomach to inflate with air. And as this rat inflates with air, it squeezes down on the bottom part of the esophagus and causes that valve to stay closed. 
and it'll stay closed for a good number of hours after we eat, which is when most people suffer from their heartburn and reflux disease. So this is a very good way to eliminate reflux. It can also, it treats the problem because it actually uh, treats the valve, the problem with the valve, but it also can treat the hiatal hernia. So it's very effective in restoring the barrier to acid, but also to bile and anything else that might be in your stomach because the more things you put in your stomach, the more air gets there and pushes down on that valve, creating a nice tight seal. Most of the time, people are able to stop all of their heartburn medicines. However, over time, just like everything else in our body, it can loosen up and when it does, you may need to restart your heartburn medicines for part of the time or once a day. So it does sometimes loosen up. Generally, we say you get a 10-year lifespan out of your fun application or your minimally invasive surgery. Some people are more fortunate and get a lifetime. The pros are that it's very well controlled. The wrap is made exactly the size that you need it Based on the testing that I do, I can decide if you need a really tight wrap or a really loose wrap, and I can put in an instrument in your esophagus during the surgery to make sure it becomes exactly what you need. It restores that valve barrier, so now the food and the acid inside your stomach cannot come up into your esophagus. It also decreases your chances of having Barrett's esophagus because you're stopping the problem with the acid. If you already have Barrett's, you have about a 30% chance that it's going to go away completely just with the surgery. But you have about a 60% chance that it's going to just progress along the normal lines that it normally would have even if you hadn't had the surgery. It also fixes the hiatal hernia. Well, what are the cons? The cons are that you have to stay in the hospital and it is surgery, so there can be complications associated with it, like you could have a heart attack or a stroke or blood clots that form in your legs, but we control for all those things, so for the most part, the chances of any of those things happening are very, very minimal. You do have to maintain an incredibly strict diet after the surgery for six weeks I completely control your diet so that you will not be able to eat a regular diet for about six weeks. And with your activity, it's the same thing. I put you on a very, very restricted activity. So it's not something you want to do right before you're taking your vacation to Haiti. You know, you want to make sure that you're doing this when you're going to be at home for a number of months. There is a fourth way of treating your reflux, which is very new. It was designed by one of my mentors, and it's been tested in a small number of surgeons around the country, but there's been more than a thousand procedures done now. It's called the Lynx System for Reflux Management. And what it is, is a metallic bracelet of beads that is then placed around the esophagus, right where your valve is. And when the food goes through, the beads will open up or distract away from each other and allow the food to go through with ease. But when you're not eating and there is nothing that needs to go through, the beads will come back together again and close that valve and prevent acid or bile or food or anything else from coming up. It's very easy to place. It takes about 20 minutes to put in in the operating room. It is done under a general anesthetic because I do insert small instruments, two small instruments into your abdomen to do so, but it's all done laparoscopically or minimally invasively. It is completely reversible. So if you have it and you don't like it for some reason, it can be taken out. You can have it done if you have a small hiatal hernia, but not if you have anything more than just a few centimeters. And the other advantage is that you can eat right away and you can continue your regular activities. There's no change in your diet or activity following the surgery. The biggest con is that the insurance companies don't often cover it in California. So welcome to California medical system. Um, but there are um, programs to help you um, defray the cost. And there are programs now that are starting to 
uh, jump on board, uh, insurance programs that are starting to jump on board and be covered. Um, that I would say that for most people who are taking regular antacid medicines, whether that's PPIs or H2 blockers, and doing diet modification that have decided that they just don't want to have to do that anymore, if they qualify through the tests, you have to have the tests ahead of time to make sure that you have uh, all the functioning parts of the esophagus and no big hiatal hernia. Um, one of the other cons is that you have to have good esophageal function and as we mentioned earlier, if you have long-standing heartburn or gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD, oftentimes your muscle can become weak and if you wait long enough it can become weak enough where you would not be able to push the food past those beads and so you would not be a qualified candidate to get it. So it's something that definitely needs to be put into uh, people who have good esophageal uh, function. So in summary, um, we know that reflux or, is, uh, or gastroesophageal reflux disease can be a serious medical condition in the sense that it can lead to serious complications like stricturing of the esophagus or ongoing pneumonias or even Barrett's esophagus that can lead to cancer. It doesn't mean that just because you have heartburn that you are going to have any serious complication. And just like Dr. Shravatsa pointed out in his talk, the majority of people who have GERD do not have anything that would then lead them to have a serious complication, but you just don't want to be one of them. We know that the testing is uncomfortable, but it is necessary. So any doctor that you go to to have your, eva your evaluation done, if they tell you you don't need to have the testing, you need to find somebody who will do it for you. There are multiple treatment options and they're not for everybody. And the best way for you to know if you're, if you're a candidate for the treatment options is to talk to somebody who's familiar with all the options, not just the one that he or her does. So which treatment is right for you? Are you going to be able to manage diet modifications or keep yourself on your medicines on a regular basis? Do you want to venture into an endoscopic procedure or something a little bit more invasive? If you have any questions or concerns, you should definitely come to see one of us. We are experts in this area. So Washington Hospital has brought us here to help the community. And both Dr. Shavatsa and I are available to counsel you to prepare you for um, whatever treatment you desire or are eligible to undergo. Okay, with that, I would like to thank Dr. Mesh and Dr. Shavasa for presenting tonight. Thank you.